Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, 45 Years on the Air is brought to you by 9X, the Pawtucket Credit Union, and Off-Track Betting. there and welcome to our celebration. Today marks 45 years of broadcasting for WJAR-TV Channel 10. I'm Art Lake and for the next hour I'll be your host as we look back at the exciting history of this television station. We'll share some magic memories and give you an inside look at television today. So please join us for yesterday, today and tomorrow, 45 years on the air. To understand how Channel 10 television came to be, you have to meet the parents of this remarkable child, the Outlet Department Store and WJAR Radio. Our story begins over a hundred years ago when two young entrepreneurs decided to test their business skills and their luck here in Rhode Island. Born in Washington, D.C. just after the Civil War, Joseph Samuels and his brother, Leon, arrived in Providence sometime in the early 1890s. They rented a storefront on Way Bossett Street and much to the dismay of the established downtown merchants, began selling their wares at cut-rate prices. The Samuel brothers call this store the Manufacturer's Outlet, boasting that they bought directly from the manufacturer and thereby sold at great discount. Under pressure from local merchants, newspapers, including the Providence Journal, refused to accept advertisements from the outlet. In 1898, the Samuels responded by publishing their own weekly paper, the Outlet Bulletin. Its pages contain both advertisements for the store wares and editorials by the Samuel brothers. In 1919, the outlet celebrated its 25th year. A pamphlet published by the store for the occasion quotes the poet Kipling. We didn't begin with askings. We took our job and stuck. We took chances they wouldn't. And now they're calling it luck. In the early 1920s, Joseph Samuels decided to try his luck with a new industry, radio broadcasting. Radio would allow the outlet to advertise its wares and improve the sale of radio receivers. On September 6, 1922, WJAR Radio went on the air. This government film, produced to inform the public of job opportunities in this new field, provides a rare look behind the scenes of the golden age of radio. The vacuum tube has been responsible for the growth of radio into a business involving thousands of people and millions of dollars. Like any business, radio broadcasting employs a great many people in general office work, such as correspondents, stenographers, file clerks, and bookkeepers. Executives and managers of special departments, salesmen who sell time on the air to advertisers, experts who select the talent for programs, are all a necessary part of radio broadcasting. Continuity writers prepare script and other writers handle publicity, news and material for special educational and farm programs. News commentators broadcast stories gathered from all corners of the world, often analyzing important events and expressing their own opinions regarding them. For regularly scheduled programs, the production department has a multitude of duties to perform primarily concerned with planning and preparing the programs to go on the air. Sound effects add realism to dramatic programs and are produced by specialists in a small, although very interesting field. Actors and actresses perform for unseen audiences and control men skillfully operate the apparatus which mixes sound effects, music and dialogue. The best the world has to offer in music, drama and comedy may be enjoyed in one's own home, for radio's greatest application is in broadcasting mass entertainment. Radio manufacturing in general is classified as unskilled work, as most of the jobs can be mastered in a very short time. Many women are employed assembling and inspecting radios as the work is not heavy. Ordinarily, such work does not lead to responsible positions and should be avoided 
unless one will be satisfied with employment in manufacturing. However, men with training are sometimes placed in the production departments of radio manufacturing plants to gain practical experience. This work serves also as a proving ground for these men, and those who qualify may advance to positions of greater responsibility. Often, the most successful radio dealers and salesmen are those who can talk with authority about the products they sell, frequently because they've had practical experience in radio repair work. Seizing an opportunity to become part of a new and exciting form of communication was a natural move for Joseph Samuels. His gamble that wireless broadcasting was more than a passing fad paid off handsomely. Mass production soon made it possible for average families to own a radio for their homes. This lovely young lady, seated in the store display window, is demonstrating the latest console model, complete with remote control. From its studio above the department store, WJAR broadcast both national and local programs. Bridges of Destiny. The Bridge Tire Company of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, distributor of Gillette Tires of Bear for Wear, presents transcribed Bridges of Destiny. You will travel a long way in this world before you find a bridge more beautiful than the Mount Hope Bridge in Rhode Island. It traces a slender design across the deep water where Narragansett Bay meets Mount Hope Bay. It is the immediate connection between Old Bristol, from which licensed pirates sailed to raid the commerce of Great Britain's enemies in colonial wars, and Older Portsmouth, where settled the few Englishmen who bought the island of Rhode Island from the Indians for 40 fathoms of white beads. Those passing over feel a lift of the spirit which they do not quite understand. And those passing under in boats instinctively look up as they approach the significant tracery of steel. Bridges of Destiny is presented each Monday, Wednesday and Friday morning at this time by the Bridge Tire Company, distributor of the famous Gillette Tire. Programs like Bridges of Destiny were popular with listeners, but what many Rhode Islanders remember best was shows like The Kitty's Review, hosted by Celia Moreau, featuring local talent from throughout the listening area, including a young Buddy Cianci. The program went on the air in 1931 and gave hundreds of talented youngsters their first crack at stardom. A little girl here, seven years of age, is Madeline Machine. She's very anxious to be waiting to take her turn at the microphone, so we won't delay now and listen to her now as she sings. Gonna By nineteen forty five, a new medium was threatening radio's monopoly. A form of communication loomed on the horizon that would forever change America's landscape and drastically alter the future of the outlet company. The great American skyscrapers become a part of the fastest growing new industry in the United States. Television, the fascinating shortwave medium of sight and sound. Atop the big towers are television transmitting antennas, each of them sending out millions of electrical impulses a second to direct a stream of electrons on distant television screens. Because the ultra-shortwave radio vibrations do not travel far beyond the horizon, the antennas have to be high to cover a large area. Thus, the tall buildings in America's cities become natural elevations from which to send this modern means of communication and entertainment. But the other end of the circuit, the receiving sets in countless homes, is perhaps the most important. For all of the technical side of television has long been known to scientists, this new medium will open new horizons in education and entertainment to all. From apartment buildings to trailer camps, television is now penetrating into every walk of American life and to a large part of the American countryside. Two million new sets are being produced every year. For Americans, as sports-minded as any other people, one of the biggest things in television programming is athletic events. Television cameramen covering the games from several angles 
capture all of the highlights for the fans who can't be in the stadiums. Baseball, America's number one sport, and one which has a season running for half the year, is number one on television too. But today, you no longer have to be in the grandstand to see and hear what's going on. The technicians of television have provided the eyes and ears so that the faraway fans can follow what is happening the very instant it is doing so. From remote pickups, all of the play as it is going on is immediately transmitted to thousands of homes. Seated comfortably in the living room, a family can watch each thrilling move the instant it takes place. These two boys hope to be big league stars themselves someday. They don't miss a bit of the play on the field. Not everyone can squeeze into a stadium which holds people merely by the thousands. Television holds them by the millions. The athlete's audience is vastly increased. A major segment of the mass television audience is children. And for the youngsters, what else is better than magical make-believe? The wonderful animals and characters of the puppet shows have an eternal charm. It's the same for the television kids of today as it was for the boys and girls of a hundred years ago. Besides entertainment for children, television is also valuable for educating them. In the United States, television like radio is a matter of private enterprise and as such is very competitive. With this competition in mind, technicians and cast alike strive to attain a flawless production. Tonight, this television workshop rehearses a play of its own. One of the instructors assigns various students to cameras, lights, and other pieces of equipment, and advises them carefully as to just how the director wants the production shot, from what angles and at what time, and so on. Meanwhile, the director himself is at work with his actors. An all-student venture, even tonight's play, has been written by a member of the class. Unlike the theater, where there is usually time for weeks of rehearsal, in television there is generally only 12 hours of preparation for actors. In television plays, every night is opening night. And then the show goes on. The entire production is now in the hands of the director, who must handle his co-workers and their television gear with every bit of skill. What is more, he has to use them within tight restrictions of space and time. What the television audience sees, of course, are only the players who are on their own now and must be letter perfect. Behind the scenes, there appears to be chaos. Actually, it is a highly skilled concentration of students and equipment, with each tense in the knowledge that their production is now on the air. The director controls and coordinates the lights, cameras, microphones, floor manager, announcer, and sound engineer. He's somewhat like the conductor of an orchestra, but with the added disadvantage of having to worry about a clock, since his show has been allowed only so many minutes on the air. While these students rehearsed for their New York debut, a real-life drama was taking place behind the scenes at the outlet department store. In 1944, representatives from NBC approached the outlet with the idea that the company establish a TV affiliate in Providence. A construction permit was issued by the FCC in 1946, after many delays, WJAR-TV went on the air three years later. The date was Sunday, July 10th, 1949. A new age had dawned for the outlet. The company began to employ men and women who were pioneers in this remarkable means of communication. No one at the time ever dreamed that television would continue to provide revenue careers and opportunities long after the department store had ceased to exist. When we return, we'll take a look at the early years of local and national television as broadcast by WJAR-TV. There's plenty of memories, laughs, and surprises, so please stay tuned for more of Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, 45 Years on the Air. They don't want their son to have sex too soon, but 
Can these parents come clean with what they did as teens? I didn't know that they would do something like that. <laughs> okay, everybody who's out there watching who's a child, your parents have made a whole lot of mistakes. <laughs> well, I thought she made no mistakes whatsoever in her whole entire life. In her whole entire life? <laughs> yes. <laughs> parents, confess. Next, Oprah. Turn to 10 for Oprah, Monday at 4. Welcome back. We're strolling along memory lane and recalling 45 years of broadcasting here on Channel 10. Right now, let's watch some examples of local television programming in the 50s and early 60s. It's really not all that long ago, but in terms of style and technique, <laughs> well, just take a look. This vintage commercial isn't selling ladders, it's selling beer. Those of you who remember when Rhode Island had its own brewery can probably sing the jingle that was the trademark of our own home brew. Hi, neighbor, have a gansett. Give this lager beer a chance. It has that strength from the barrel taste. In bottle, can on tap or case. Yes, gansett's got the flavor. Narragansett flavor. Gansett light. But not too light. Straight from the barrel taste. Oh, that's right. That's gansett. Brewed just right for drinking. With straight from the barrel taste, the way beer tastes best, that's Gansett. From bottle, can, or tap. Straight from the barrel taste, oh, that's right, that's Gansett. This is Saturday, and we came up to the Boston Garden backstage of the Ice Capades. To All of Ensign Tinder hosted a show called uh, People Are Talking that featured interviews with visiting celebrities. Like in their when the Ice Capades came to town, you know, Olive Ice was on the scene. For their beautiful costumes, and each year they seem to be more beautiful than they were the year before. I see some of them around, and I think I'll call them in now. Oh, you're Stig, don't you? That's right, Olive. Stig Larson. And, you, and you play uh, badminton with uh, Hugh Foggy. That's right, Olive. Well, it's so nice to see both of you. Um, what are you going to do this year, particularly? How are you going to get into uh, uh, your act? pick on me by the looks of things, isn't he? Well, he looks like he's going to. Are you really going to arrest him and take him away in the paddy wagon? Well, I'd like to, but uh, <laughs> if he doesn't behave, eh? Jim Kelly, a little bit of New Orleans with the exciting music of the old French Quarter. Jim Kelly brings traditional Dixieland music to New England with new thrills in sight and sound with the jazzland music of the Bio Five. Plus this evening's guests, Jazz Ashford and Carol Van. And our Jim Kelly host, Johnny King. UKRA is a good example of the kind of diverse programming that provided an outlet for local musical talent. The show ran from 6.30 to 7 every night. Wow, good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Welcome to UKRA. An old square in New Orleans, a sidewalk cafe down there where everything goes and a good time is had by all, and jazz is the byword. Good evening, men. Good evening, good evening John. John. Another local favorite was the Eddie Zach Show. It offered Western music and featured some of the nation's best stars as guests. The show was broadcast coast to coast, also on NBC Radio. And when you hear me rattle, you better fall down on your knees. Oh, well, I rattle down in Georgia, rattle down in New Orleans. I rattle down in Georgia, I rattle down in New Orleans. And when you hear me rattle, you better fall down on your knees. This isn't just a hoop, Lion. It's an exclusive Coco Marsh spinning glow hoop. Long yeah. before Barney, the Polka Dinosaur, one, a clever black and white rapper called Hippity Hop movie. was the big favorite with Channel 10 wow. youngsters. Planning that. ahead for his retirement, what Hippity wasn't with? above a bit of Just product endorsement. It. See, Lion, Gorilla's spinning the Coco Marsh spinning glow hoop around his arm, and boys and girls and everybody can spin them around their necks and legs, too. I'm making Coco Marsh and milk with the wonderful Coco Marsh soda fountain pump. It's so much fun, and Coco Marsh has extra iron and vitamin D for extra strength and energy. And it's mmm, so delicious and chocolatey. Good morning, boys and girls. Honey Calvi was the host of a Saturday morning children's program. 
Here, we find her visiting a grammar school in East Providence back in the days of reading and writing and arithmetic. And I'm sure you'd like to meet the principal of the school, Mrs. Miss Murray. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Miss Murray. Oh, we're happy to have you, Miss Thank you. And uh, you're the I'm first grade, grade teacher Mrs. and Mrs. Hand. Mrs. Hand. You certainly have a lovely class. And uh, I was wondering if we could have a lesson with your children this morning. Oh, we'd enjoy that very much. Good. Yes, they'd be so pleased. Good. Now, children, uh, if we're ready for our lesson, you get your black crayon and hold your paper the way you have it on your desk. And this morning, we're going to draw a log cabin. A favorite holiday broadcast featured Walter Covell as Santa Claus and Beamish, his helpful assistant. Oh, fine, Beamish, fine. Now, let me see. That's for Peter in Pawtucket. Now, did you finish the doll for Florence in Fall River? Yesterday! Oh, fine. But I'll bet you didn't test the sled for Albert in Attleboro, now, did you? Yep. Oh, <laughs> wonderful, Beamish, wonderful. And because you've been such a fast worker... And because you have gotten all the toys ready way ahead of Christmas time, I'm going to see that Mrs. Santa Claus gives you a very special dessert for night for supper. There were, of course, programs with a more serious viewpoint. Betty Adams hosted The World Around Us, a show that gave viewers an inside angle on the events of the day. Betty once even traveled to Paris to interview syndicated columnist Art Buckwald. But Art, you say you got a job in Variety, you got a job in the Harrow Trib. You had to go looking for that. There was something about this country that must have captured some part of you. Well, I think Paris captures the imagination of all young people, and uh, particularly young writers. And Why? I came... Well, because this is a place where Hemingway wrote, this is a place where Gertrude Stein lived, this is a place where Scott Fitzgerald was, and all the writers of America. Well, it's always been a very imaginative place to start in, and that Paris Herald has uh, been one of the great papers of the world for young people. And so with all these things, I decided Paris was the place for me. Long before MTV, Al Rucker and his gang brought music video to our viewers. Here's a classic tune that captures the spirit of that show. That's the McGuire sisters with the ring-a-ding-a-ding-dong. Al Rucker later brought his show to New York. In the early years of Channel 10 television, you could never be sure who would beam down to be interviewed on such programs as the ever-popular Talk of the Town. Who created Mr. Spock and the Spock haircut and the pointed ears? I think it's a kind of an interesting story. A fellow named Gene Roddenberry, who was a producer of a series called The Lieutenant on NBC about three or four years ago, um, got the idea. I had worked for him on, uh, on The Lieutenant once, and he said to my agent, I'm, I have a science fiction show in mind that I'm going to put pointed ears on that guy. So we laughed and forgot about it. And sure enough, about six months later, he said, we're re ready to shoot the pilot. So we started working on the makeup. Now, what he had in mind was somebody who would look like he was from another planet, be unemotional and cool and calculating. Uh, the whole makeup was not conceived at the beginning. He did know that he wanted pointed ears, but the rest of it had to be worked out. So we started working on the haircut. And I tried various cuts and what have you, and finally evolved to this, did away with the part that I used to wear. And then I shaved off the outer half of my eyebrows. Now, they're almost grown back in. Now we've been off for about three or four weeks. And uh, we experimented with a raised eyebrow, which we finally arrived at. 
And then about three or four days before we shot the pilot, I got nervous about the ears. Because I thought, well, you know, this is, I'm a serious actor. What is this with pointed ears, you know? And I went to Gene and I said, look, I'd like to do away with the ears. I think we've got enough going for us with the haircut and the eyebrows. He said, no. He said, those ears are going to be very popular and very famous. And they're going to make you popular and famous. And he said, I, I promise you that if you'll do 13 shows with those ears, that at the end of the 13 shows, if you're not happy with it, we'll write a script where you get an ear job. So on that basis, we went ahead, and then, of course, at the end of 13 shows, we laughed about it because I wouldn't give them up for anything. Host Jay Kroll brought a steady stream of celebrities to our viewers' living rooms. One of the liveliest interview shows was Talk Back, hosted by multi-talented Jack Cumley. These flowers here, believe it or not, this, this type of a flower, Jack, you can get Hawaiian music out of. Mm-mm. Yeah. Go ahead, watch. Rex. No, no, really, watch. Got to listen close now. Wait a minute. Let me put a mic. Can you get the microphone up close? I'll get mine up close to it. You leave yeah. yours where it is. Okay. Wait a minute. If we're going to have this. This okay, is the kind of guy who would have a saw. Oh, this is true. Right? You, you played the saw. Yeah, listen. Time, didn't you? <laughs> oh, you led me right down the path. You get out of here, O'Mara. We'll be back in just a moment. Did we sing them or did we sing them? <laughs> in the 50s and 60s, Channel 10 brought viewers a wide range of popular national programs. And of course, when you have network shows, you also have network commercials, such as this ad for General Tire. Don't let the voice fool you. This isn't an expose of faulty merchandise. It's just the type of work that Mike Wallace did long before 60 Minutes. Here's a family doing something no one in this country thinks is unusual. They're going on a trip 500 miles, the whole family all together in one automobile. This man owns a nice car, owns his home, has a good job, and above everything else, he feels strongly about his family. They're all in that car, and he keeps them safe on general. Everything he values depends on what happens now. At today's street and highway speeds, you're a split second from perfect safety or a murderous accident. 118 feet ahead is a little girl with her eight-month-old brother in that baby buggy. At 40 miles an hour, you'll hit her in two seconds. On ordinary tires, you can't stop short of that little girl. On dual traction generals, you have that power to stop. What is a set of new generals worth to you? If they prevent one serious accident to you, your wife, your children. What's new at the Nelsons? You can depend on it every week there's going to be a new crisis in the lives of this very well-known American family. That's because Harriet never knows what to expect next from her unpredictable brood. Will Ozzie get her involved in some new project that backfires in his face? Why? Yes. Okay, why didn't I mind my own business? And what will Ricky and David cook up next? It just has to be something involving music and girls. Ricky Nelson had a date, E-I-E-I-O. And on this date he had three girls, E-I-E-I-O. So you're all invited to share the fun and all the warm-hearted togetherness that makes the Nelsons represent all that's best in American family life. The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. MTA presents How to Marry a Millionaire. Meet Laurie Nelson, who plays Greta, a Phi Beta Kappa, no less, who wants a man with brains as well as brawn. This is Mary Anders as Mike. She checks out her men in Dun & Bradstreet and uses Wall Street as a happy hunting ground. And this is Barbara Eden as Loco. Beautiful, yes. Dumb, no. Oh, the oath. On my honor, I promise to do my best to help one of us marry a millionaire. All for one and one for all. So help us for it now. Three female musketeers on a merry manhunt. It's light, it's bright. See three bright-eyed beauties bent on millionaire manslaughter. How about that new album, Music to Sign Checks by? Don't miss How to Marry a Millionaire. 
We've grubbed and we've scraped, but we never took no charity and we ain't the... It's Walter Brennan, roaring like a lion, but gentle as a lamb, heading up the liveliest, warmest, funniest family show on TV, The Real McCoys. For family fun, there's nothing like gathering around the good old fireplace. And you want to feel up to the fun that's so good for you. But take a look at Mom. She just doesn't feel good enough to have any fun. Whenever that all-in, all-over feeling from a headache, upset stomach, or general achiness keeps you from having fun, take Alka-Seltzer, the medicine that's so refreshing. Feel up to the fun that's so good for you. When you need relief of headache, upset stomach, or general achiness, take Alka-Seltzer, the medicine that's so refreshing. Well, that's just a small sample of the type of programming you'd have seen in the 50s and 60s here on Channel 10. When we return, we'll take a look at early news stories from as far back as 1955. We've dug up some lost treasures, so be sure to join us when we return. It's time again for Swing Time with Joe Rocco. When you're putting, you have to have a relaxed grip. Line up your putt, and remember, concentration is everything. Here's another tip. Sign up now for the 1994 Boys Town Golf Classic. It's real golf and a great way to help troubled children here in Rhode Island. Boys Town gives so much to the less fortunate boys and girls in our community, but with your help, they can do more. Conquer this hole, onto the windmill. It's decision time again, and Newswatch 10 is here to help. Help you make decision 94. Who are the candidates? What are the issues? Why should you turn to 10? It's safe to say we cover the political action like no other station. More reporters out here on the streets. Explaining the issues. Getting it right. Then getting it to you faster than anyone else. Don't be misinformed this election season. Turn to 10. Turn to 10. Turn to 10. Hello again. This is the 45th anniversary of Channel 10 Television, and we're celebrating with a look at our past, present, and future. On previous anniversaries, we've shown you the big stories that we've covered over the years. But this time, we decided to do something a little different. We've selected film clips, each from the month of July, that give you a sense of an average summer day starting almost four decades ago. The year is 1955, and a train wreck in nearby Bridgeport, Connecticut, is the top story. The engineer was killed and 24 passengers were injured. Witnesses said the train was going, quote, in excess of 30 miles an hour. In the same week, Bishop McVinney dedicated a new building at Providence College. A respectful audience watched quietly as Alumni Hall was added to the campus with all the appropriate pomp and ceremony. Also in that July of 55, the CBs of Quonset Point prepared for an Arctic expedition. You can bet that it was a lot warmer in North Kingstown than where they were headed. We certainly hope they packed their long johns before setting sail. In the summer of 1956, it was time to tune up the old Model T and take her out for a spin. Remember, these cars were only half as old as they are today, so we hope their owners have taken good care of them. Fun and sun on the bay hasn't really changed all that much, except perhaps the style of swimsuits. And take a look at these characters speeding around in their new power boats. I wonder what they're driving today. In 1957, ground was broken for the Goddard Hospital in Stoughton, Massachusetts. 
It would be two more years before this facility would open, complete with 58 beds for those needing the best that modern medicine could offer. Smiling faces and happy children attracted our photographers to this festival in Wickford way back in 57. Hard to believe that most of these youngsters are now raising their own families. Nothing like a hot day in July to open a new stretch of highway. And that's just what Governor Denny Roberts did in 1958. Route 146 hasn't looked this good in a long time. But who knows, with its long history of repairs, maybe Department of Transportation crews were on the scene later that day. summer in the city. The sights, the sounds, the smells, especially when the city is Norwich, Connecticut in July of 1959 and there is a garbage collector's strike. Citizens were forced to take matters into their own hands which resulted in some very messy situations. And no matter how hot it gets, there's nothing like a roaring fire to draw a crowd. Our records don't even reveal the exact location of this place, probably somewhere in Providence. But as you can see, while firefighting equipment may have changed in the last 35 years, human curiosity has not. July of 1960 brought Tropical Storm Brenda to our shores. With memories of the hurricane of 54 still fresh in people's minds, most residents had prepared for the worst. But the storm, born in the Gulf of Mexico, lost much of its strength as it journeyed across Florida and up the Carolinas. By the time it struck Rhode Island, top winds were under 50 miles per hour and damage was minor. In 1961, our photographers were back at Quonset Point, this time capturing the advanced training techniques of the fighting CBs. On a hot summer day, you've got to wonder how many young men were tempted to take the plunge into this water hazard. This is the kind of film we love to rediscover, one that hasn't been broadcast in over 30 years. There's nothing special about the event, just a young president arriving at Hyannis Airport for a much needed vacation. But the year was 1962, and today each recorded moment of John Kennedy's brief term seems somehow precious. The Wickford Art Festival of 63 proved once again the timeless value of true art. Just as they do today, people flocked to this annual event over 30 years ago. And who knows what living room or den these priceless treasures are now calling home. Here's another lost gem from our past. The year is 1964 and talk show host Jay Kroll is crowning Miss TV 10. Who was our reigning queen that year, and where is she today? We're not sure, but we hope she's watching and sharing these fond memories with us. July of 1965 was a hot year for local surfers. This group of young wave riders have gathered at Narragansett Town Beach to demonstrate form and physique 
They're wasting their time trying to impress these ladies. It seems the women have already mastered the art and might be able to teach the lads a thing or two. Meanwhile, in the city of Providence, federal agents are making arrests. This camera shy individual was one of a dozen suspects charged with multiple counts of violating federal gambling laws. And remember folks, back then, the state didn't encourage gambling in any form. If you were looking for a faster way to reach the islands off Cape Cod in 1966, then you probably had your eye on this hydrofoil demonstration which took place in July of that year. Whatever became of this miracle of technology, seems to me we're still relying on ferry service. And here's a story from 1967 that shows how, in some ways, we've actually improved our environment. This tour of Upper Narragansett Bay focused attention on the need to clear away old pilings and debris. And in fact, much of this unsightly mess has been removed. Hopefully, future generations will see even greater improvements. Nineteen sixty eight brings color film to our homes and some colorful characters, too. The log entry for this news story is Obscene Literature Raid, and it seems that police have grabbed films as well as books deemed a threat to society. With plenty of risque material available at today's local video rental stores, it's difficult to remember what all the fuss was about. One problem that has grown only larger over the years has been drug abuse, especially in our inner cities. These individuals are the targets of a Providence narcotics raid in the summer of 1968. On the night of July 10, 1969, Quonset Point helicopter on a routine training flight developed engine trouble 200 feet over the water. Three Navy flyers jumped out of the chopper moments before it crashed into Narragansett Bay. Miraculously, all three escaped injury and the remains of their craft were salvaged the next day. 1970 brought a new decade and a new park for residents of South Providence. The project was part of the Model Cities program that got its start in the 60s. still sense the community pride that projects like this help to spark. More high-tech adventures in 1971 as a daring pilot lands his gyroplane on Goat Island in Newport. Senator Claiborne Pell is on hand to greet this aviation pioneer and to witness firsthand the new form of transportation scheduled for everyday use in the distant 1990s. And on a much more serious note, this film captures the timeless image of soldiers leaving for war. Rhode Island sent many of its sons and daughters to fight in Vietnam. We don't know what happened to these brave young men, but we hope and pray that each and every one of them returned home safely. On a sunny summer day in 1972, we sent our news crew to Block Island to film a parade. It may not have been the biggest story that week, but it was a colorful event. Naturally, politicians took the opportunity to say a few words, and people paid about as much attention as they normally do when the sun is shining and the wind is warm. In 1973, there was a real hot story on Fountain Street in Providence. A fire broke out in a heating duct at the Providence Journal. Heat from a fan that drew gases from pots of molten lead in the stereotype room was the culprit. And fortunately, no one was injured. 
Needless to say, the story made the next morning's front page. And finally, in July of 1974, WJAR-TV celebrated 25 years of broadcasting. We marked the occasion by showing viewers some of the modern technologies we were using to bring them the finest in local programming. industry was on the verge of a turning point, as videotape was soon to revolutionize the way we gathered news. We're making it the last stop on our tour of the archives. After all, we have to save something for our 50th anniversary special. We'll be back in a moment with a behind-the-scenes look at television today. Before we go to our break, though, we'd like to thank our good friends at the Rhode Island Historical Society, who have been the custodians of our films for so many years. When we return, we'll share some insights and some outtakes, so please stay tuned. Welcome back. We've been strolling down memory lane for most of this program, but now we'd like to take a look at television today. And what better way than with a behind-the-scenes look at our new broadcast facilities here in Cranston. Channel 10 produces five different newscasts each weekday. It's a task that requires plenty of team effort. My coverage from NBC at the top of the hour, and once they're done, we will not have a commercial break before we start our newscast, and we will not have an open. Covering the news throughout southern New England keeps our reporters and our photographers on the go all day long. As we approach noontime, our Emmy award-winning news set becomes a beehive of activity. Each individual, on the screen or behind the scenes, knows that they have an important role to play in every newscast. An explosion out of big mill and strange as it sounds, it may have been sparked by a passing car. Mob boss Raymond Patriarch. Our technicians check and recheck their take times and cues. There's no margin of error. A news broadcast is a live event and viewers will instantly be aware of any mistakes. The technical quality of the transmission is constantly monitored. Quality control of what you see and hear has the highest priority. Our equipment takes plenty of wear and tear, but fortunately, we have a skilled crew of experts trained to keep the tools of our trade in tip-top shape. They pride themselves on their knowledge of the very latest innovations in their craft. That's it. It's din din time for Morris. Even as our new news is being broadcast, the evening reports are being analyzed and explored. With all the technology that surrounds us, it's important to remember that it's people who make Channel 10 Southern New England's leading news station. People working together to keep our viewers informed and up to date with the world around them. Did you see what this man has on his computer over here? I mean, talk about humiliating. And our anchor team, well, here's a behind Take the a scenes look. look. Oh my God. Now, is that <laughs> my dream? Is this not disrespect? <laughs> what can I tell you? Thanks for the offer, the cracker, I love him. See, he shares, too, that's... <laughs> so what are we talking about here? Our veteran reporters are constantly sharing information and resources. Yeah. As the final minutes tick away, our night crew is ready, willing and able, to carry out the complex task of bringing you the evening news. It's a demanding operation, but people here at Channel 10 take pride in their work and pride in the fact that you have chosen us as your source of news and information. You know we really do our best to bring you a flawless newscast every time. But let's face it, we're only human. As our birthday present to you, we thought it might be fun to share a few of our less than perfect moments. Let's check the weather forecast now. Good morning, Art. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Our assignment <laughs> editor making a guest appearance on the program. <laughs> Newswatch 10's 19 reporter Katerina Bandini is live in Cranston with their reaction. Katerina, can you see me? Yes, I can. Very close up. <laughs> Here I am. The shot we all look forward to. 
tonight, the forecast. Uh, actually, oh, you know, I didn't change this weather computer. Don't look at that. I didn't change this weather computer from, uh, from don't look at that. I didn't, there we go. Tonight, <laughs> comfortable. Good morning, it's 48 degrees in Providence right now, and Art will check out the forecast right after we see about the traffic. Good morning, Tony. Hey, good morning, Frank. God, I, well, we suspect confused from time to time. Okay, here's what's happening on the roadways. Uh, fire in the sky. Tony DiBiazio? Weather is supposed to be next. Let's place bets on what will show up. <laughs> I, I tried to synchronize my lips. I'm sorry. Good morning, everyone. They tell you to go this way, but they don't tell you where the detour is. I want to get out on Route 6. How do I get there? I don't know, ma'am. Yeah. I just read about you and how great you are, and you don't know? <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> that's great. Well, friends, that's our show. We hope you've had as much fun as we did. It's been our privilege and good fortune to be invited into your home since 1949. Thanks for turning to 10 for all those years, and thanks for joining us tonight to celebrate 45 years on the air.